Hello and welcome again to Geometric View. Think Kerala and anyone starts counting its blessings. A long coastline, a beautiful landscape, arresting natural beauty, pristine backwaters, 100% literacy for more than three decades, an exposure to almost every country and culture in the world, particularly to the Arabic, Portuguese, Dutch, French and British. A diaspora that is a few million strong and who send home more than a trillion rupees every year in remittance. 44 rivers, 120 days of rain every year. A public health system that is now acclaimed around the world. Four international airports and planning a fifth. Among the few places in the world which hosts the Binale, life expectancy and infant mortality rates that are among the best in the world, spice capital of the world, and bang in the middle of the international sea route between Singapore and the Middle East. And yet, and yet, despite this absolutely enviable list of riches for any place in the whole world, Kerala is punching way below its weight. Is it prosperous? Sort of. Is it a paradise? Not really. So what is it? Like the cartoon character Richie Rich, Kerala is India's poor little rich state. So for instance, it cannot tap and market its sweet toddy or neera because of a maze of rules and regulations. A farmer in Kerala cannot plant a high-yielding rambutan fruit tree in a coffee estate, in a low-yielding coffee estate, because it violates the Land Reforms Act made 57 years ago. And the state cannot visualize a way to navigate out of COVID and rebuild livelihoods, but only think like the federal government of locking people in indefinitely. The poor little rich boy imagery came to the limelight again this week when India's Supreme Court gave its verdict on the Sri Patmanabha Swami Temple, which sits in the heart of Tiruvananthapuram city, Kerala's capital. The court reinstated the trusteeship of the former Travancore royal family on the temple's administration. Now, the Patmanabha Swami Temple is considered the richest in the world for its collection of gold, silver, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and a lot of antiques and even coins from Alexander's days, all of which are valued at more than a trillion rupees. However, the temple earns just about enough to pay salaries to staff. Two kilometers from the temple sits the Kerala government, the other poor little rich boy of the tiny but beautiful capital of Kerala, Tiruvananthapuram. When this government came to power in 2016, the finance minister, who is an economist, had said that the treasury was empty. And the government then proceeded to release full-page, front-page advertisements in most of the Kerala dailies and some of the important national dailies, spending quite a few million rupees. That's like a family head calling his family members and saying, Hey, know something? We're broke. So what we're going to do is hold a feast, put up a pandal and celebrate because we need to tell the whole world that we'll come back more powerful, stronger. Then came the Oki cyclone and then Kerala had the floods in 2018 and 2019 and this year there's COVID. In 2018, after the floods, Kerala had come out with a begging bowl in front of the world. 2020, COVID is a time to trigger that thought again. Keralites should now fear another round of full-page advertisements. And worse, we come to know this week that the state is perhaps so broke that the Ramadan kits for Kerala came from the UAE consulate. So how has the state managed to remain a pauper on top of its riches? Ask around and you get answers like corruption, unhelpful trade unions, 
nepotism, or poor political leadership. But many of these are generic and apply to the rest of India as well. So let's consider some that are more Kerala specific. To put them as A, B, C, an addiction to remittance, a blatant disregard for law, and a compulsive conspiracy theory for everything. The addiction to remittance has been ingrained in Keralites for nearly half a century now, counting from the 1970s. Annual remittances over the past few years have been over a trillion rupees. Unfortunately, all that money has not gone into capital formation or productive investments. The Gulf migration actually solved or at least camouflaged Kerala's unemployment crisis to a large extent. But unfortunately, alternate job opportunities were not created in the state until the 1990s when the IT, tourism and health sectors emerged to absorb some of Kerala's youth. B. A blatant disregard for law. Not that this is something specific to Kerala, but what is worrying is that this trend is being observed in Kerala too. In recent days, there have been a number of instances where political leaders have threatened law enforcers in public. Now, these are the people who control the trade unions and you can imagine what potential investors to the state would think. There has been such trouble that one of Kerala's well-known industrialists, Kochausef Chitilapalli, even went to the extent of unloading his stuff from a truck. This week, Kerala's law and order took another dent when a woman accused of smuggling gold through diplomatic baggage and her accomplices could flee the state, driving some 350 kilometers along the main highways of the state, even through places with triple lockdown, right through toll gates and across the state border, even while all the Kerala policemen were supposedly looking for them. And once they were out of Kerala police's territory, the National Investigation Agency could easily nab them. See, a conspiracy theory behind almost everything. As a joke goes, if it was a team of Keralites who were planning a man on the moon mission in 1969, that team would still have been discussing 51 years later all the possible dangers on the moon without ever sending a man out there. One senior communist leader in Kerala has seen a conspiracy behind the coronavirus. According to him, the coronavirus is a result of extreme right-wing capitalist economic policies and therefore we need to fight an ideological warfare against the virus. These conspiracy theories have delayed almost every project in Kerala. One example, that of the Vallar Padam port in Kochi, Kerala's commercial capital, from the time it was dreamt to the time it was realized, took almost 70 years. So journalists in Cochin say that at least two generations of them have reported about that port and retired. Even more striking is the case of the Virinyam project in the south of the state. In 1906, Malayala Manorama, the leading newspaper of the state, reported that the Virinyam project should not be delayed any further. 114 years after that report, that port is now under construction. For nearly half a century, many Kerala families earned their bread by educating and exporting their sons and daughters abroad. Now, even that looks difficult given the ever-declining standards of Kerala's higher education. So, Kerala's youth who can afford it are now going abroad for higher studies from Canada to the UK and from Australia to China. In fact, it was some medical students from Kerala in China who were among the early carriers of coronavirus to India. Kerala's much publicized and much acclaimed education and health sectors have deep ironies embedded in them. For example, on the education side, of Kerala's 500,000 plus 
government employees, nearly half are employed in the education sector. And of the salaries paid out by the state government, the education sector accounts for as much as 49%. And yet, for all that investment in education, the market gives it a thumbs down and youth travel abroad for higher education without preferring what is offered in Kerala. Much the same goes for the health sector. The Washington Post may have praised Kerala's public health system, but the journalists probably are not aware that when the Kerala chief minister or senior political leaders have an ailment, they go to America and not take treatment in Kerala. What is worrying is that the expectations of people from the government have fallen so low that recently when an MLA in Kotayam district sanctioned an LED bulb to a village, it was praised and even published in the largest circulated daily. Perhaps Kerala's supposedly politically enlightened voters are not aware that praising an MLA for sanctioning an LED bulb is like thanking an ATM for disbursing money. But even such tall odds should not worry Kerala given its numerous riches. The Kerala government can perhaps foot all its expenses by selling clean drinking water alone. Every cent of Kerala receives 150,000 litres of water every year. Water to Kerala is almost what petroleum is to Saudi Arabia. But despite all that water that the state receives, the ground reality is that the water administration is so poor that around the year one can see tanker lorries retailing water. For a political analogy, Kerala is a lot like the Congress party. Its former president Rahul Gandhi said, the party doesn't care if its youth leaders desert the party and go away. Kerala seems to say much the same to its youth who have to leave the state in search of jobs. Good riddance and good remittance. And when so many youth leave the state over so many years, that would make Kerala like the Politburo of the Communist Party of India Marxist, stacked with senior citizens. For criticizing the Congress and the Communists, the conspiracy theorists would confirm that I am a BJP supporter. To reiterate my point, Kerala is quite like a Harry Houdini in the reverse. Tie up that legendary magician in knots, chain him, put him in a cage, drown him in water, he will still manage to come out. Give Kerala all the riches on a platter. Kerala will still find ways to tie itself up in knots. Just how can the Padmanabha Swami temple be sitting on such incredible amount of wealth and only be barely able to pay salaries? Just how can the Kerala government be sitting on such humongous wealth with so much natural resources, so much human resources and be perennially broke? How does one manage to be a poor little rich boy? Ask the temple, ask the government, ask Kerala. Thank you.